Uh, so welcome back, everyone, from what I'm sure was a very enriching afternoon. Um, we're very excited about this final keynote session. Uh, it's entitled, Preparing for the Next Epidemic. Um, we have speakers Dr. Jim Neaton, Dr. Michael Osterholm, and Dr. Sonia Rasmussen. Um, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, so I'm probably biased, but these are the real heavy hitters in the field, so we're really excited about this panel. Um, these are literally the folks that CDC has on speed dial when they're trying to deal with uh, antimicrobial resistance or outbreaks of Zika and Ebola. Um, this session will be moderated by Dr. Susan Klein. She is head of the division of, or she is in the division of infectious diseases at the uh, School of Medicine, and is no less a giant in her field of healthcare-associated infections particularly in identifying novel devices and practices to prevent these infections. Uh, please join me in welcoming these experts to the stage. Hi, and thank you for the introduction. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself and then introduce the speakers and tell you what sort of format we'll be using today. So I am an infectious disease physician at the University of Minnesota Medical School, and I do practice in the medical center and clinic. Then I'm also the hospital epidemiologist, and I am actually an alumni of the School of Public Health. I did get a master's in public health and epidemiology, so I use that still. And um, so today, I just wanted to let you know that what we're gonna do is have the three speakers come up individually and give some background. They're gonna be talking about epidemics that we've been dealing with in the recent past and then talking about looking into the future and preparing for future epidemics. And then after they've each had a chance to give some background, we're gonna have some moderated discussion between the speakers and then we are gonna welcome questions from the audience. So I want you to start thinking about your questions, and there should be some cards on your tables that you can write questions on, and there'll be someone coming through the audience to pick up cards, and if you wanna ask your questions directly, there will be someone coming through the audience uh, with a microphone. And so now I just wanna um, briefly tell you about our three speakers. Jim Neaton is a professor of biostatistics in the School of Public Health here at the University of Minnesota, and he's really an expert in design, conduct, and analysis at clinical trials. And he's um, done a lot of really um, important work related to clinical trials internationally with HIV treatment. And then uh, most recently, he's been very involved with response to the Ebola outbreaks in Africa, in particular working on vaccine trials and he can tell you more about that. And then we also have Dr. Osterholm. Michael Osterholm is a Regents Professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences, and he has done uh, really a lot of work over his career, initially at the Minnesota Department of Health as the state epidemiologist, and then since joining the um, School of Public Health here, he's been very active, not only locally, but nationally and internationally and has served on advisory boards for biosecurity. So he'll be starting off our session. And then our last speaker will be Sonia Rasmussen. And Dr. Rasmussen is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Epidemiology, College of Medicine, and the School of Public Health and Health Professions at the University of Florida. And Dr. Rasmussen recently joined the University of Florida faculty after spending 20 years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. And while there, she provided significant scientific expertise and leadership dealing uh, with birth defects, developmental disabilities, associate director for science, senior scientist. She worked on the 2009 H1N1 pandemic and then most recently worked on the Zika outbreak. So now I'm going to ask Dr. Osterholm to come up to start off the session. Thank you, Sue, and good afternoon to all of you. It's a true honor to be here today and celebrating the 75th anniversary. It uh, does give me pause uh, that uh, 
we're hitting 75. I actually was one of the co-chairs of the 50th anniversary celebration 25 years ago, and I don't know where those 25 years went. Um, so, and this marks my 45th year of being at School of Public Health, so it's a, a wonderful experience to be here today. So my job is to kind of provide a quick overview of what we're talking about today and where we're going. Let me just say that my life is a calculus equation. I can tell you that probably more has happened in infectious diseases in the last 10 years than happened in the first 35 years of my career. And it's getting faster and faster and faster. And today I'll try to reflect that, because that's the world that we respond to. That's the world that we live in and have to deal with. This slide uh, is one of about 80,000 slides I have in my electronic slide file. And I've said over and over again, even though it's an older slide, if I had one slide to protect in a slide file fire, this is the one I'd rescue. It uh, basically was come from the 2000 time period, but it gives you a sense of the dynamics of the world today. In 1850, we had roughly 350,000 people in the face of the earth, uh, th 350 million people in the face of the earth. And today we're at 7.8 billion people. Uh, that's a remarkable concept to think of, of how the world has changed. In terms of days to circumnavigate the globe with the fast sailing vessels, we sped that up a bit uh, in the 1850s, but by 1950 with the jet engine, we changed that completely. Now that line looks pretty flat from 1950 on. I will suggest to you right now that that's the most uh, incredibly dynamic part of the entire graph. And I'll share with you today why that's important with infectious diseases. I might also add in this graph, this is public health at its finest. Just remember that in 1900, average life expectancy in this country was 45 years. Grant you, men, not quite as long as women. Today, the average life expectancy is 78 years. A little again, men not doing quite as well as women. For every three and a half days we've lived in the last century, we've gained one day of life expectancy. Think about that. It took us from 80,000 generations in the caves to get to 45 years. Think where we've come. That's all public health, basically public health. How is the world changing? Well, this is an example, and we're going to hear about this today when we talk about Ebola. But today, the fastest growing region of the world is not Asia. It's not in many parts. It's actually Central Africa. Kinshasa today, 13.8 million people, uh, and four other, other cities in the DRC, over a million. I was in Kinshasa in 1985 working on uh, HIV. I can tell you at that time when the population was 2.8 million people, look at the difference just since 1985. 6.5 billion people, a million people live in Kinshasa in some of the worst squalor you could imagine in terms of, of the kind of living conditions, and I'll show you that in a minute. A big challenge. The other cities you can see, whether they're Lagos, Nairobi, down the line, all of these. In fact, Monrovia, Freetown, and Conakry, the three capital cities of West Africa where the Ebola epidemic took off in 2014-15, Really, if you look at the 4.2 million combined population, it was just a gas can waiting for an Ebola match to hit it. Kinshasa is a gas tanker waiting for an Ebola match to hit it. This is Kinshasa as we know it today. If you've ever been there, you will never forget it. It's incredible conditions for which lack of sewage, lack of city planning, etc., is a cauldron for the development and the spread of infectious diseases. And if we want to worry about can bugs move, I've always said a, a germ anywhere in the world today could be everywhere tomorrow. Think about this, in 2018, 4.1 billion international domestic air passengers flew somewhere between point A and point B. Now some of us flew more than once. That was 39.4 million flights, an average of about 108,000 flights per day, or at any one time, about 4,800 planes are in the air going from somewhere to somewhere. Think how that mixes up all the potential infectious agents that we could imagine. Very different than that fast sailing vessel I showed you uh, where it was uh, at a moment ago. In terms of the U.S., 360, uh, 632 million individuals representing about 18.6% of all passengers worldwide, and China was next at 550 million. The bottom line is we are a big mixing vessel today, unlike at any time in history. That adds complexity to infectious diseases. This slide, which I took this morning, every hour in the hour, all 63,000 fast sailing vessels in the world, our basic warehouses for all the goods that we use every day, report their location and weather conditions. We track this. You can tell where hurricanes are coming, typhoons, etc. These fast sailing vessels, like this one right here, are now the new modern warehouse of manufacturing from around the world. 
just to give you some uh, sense of the size of these, this particular ship right here can hold one million washing machines on its trip from Seoul to uh, Long Beach, California. Gives you a sense of the dynamics. Well, this is also a challenge for us today from an infectious disease perspective in particular, because you're going to see in a minute, we need a lot of things from around the world to deal with our jobs every day. This is an area that I think is by far one of the biggest crises we're yet to face, but we will face it, I worry, sooner than later. We're now involved with a study supported by the Walton Family Foundation. This has been something near and dear to my heart, and I wrote about in, the, in my book several years ago that I published, is the absence of critical acute care drugs when we need them. It turns out that we brought together a group and defined what is the high likelihood that people will die within eight hours without this drug or cannot provide humane care without this drug or an alternative. We identified 153 drugs across 28 drug categories. It turns out that well over 94% originate from China. Either the APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, is made in China and sent to India, or it's actually made in China. Today, China has us literally hostage. If we, we could not go to war today with China, we would lose immediately, because today there are many thousands and thousands of people dependent on these drugs every day. 690,000 Americans in end-stage renal disease or advanced renal disease, all their medications, much of their dialysis are coming from China. And yet these are drugs, by the way, we're putting to tariffs on. So when one looks at this, you realize anything that would interrupt trade or travel, like a pandemic, could have collateral damage far beyond anything we could imagine. Our own modeling would suggest more people will die in the first six months of a severe influenza pandemic from the lack of these drugs will die from influenza itself. If you look at the shortage situation that's occurring because of the manufacturing challenges just with making these drugs available regularly, not during a crisis, you can see here as you look that today, the, these are the hundred, of the 153 drugs, look at these numbers here and you can get a sense. As of right now, 63 of those 153 drugs are on shortage status in this country. We are constantly opting out to find some way to get an alternative or a different drug. This is just every day. Also, we're going to be facing water shortages that are going to be remarkable. We have been mining groundwater around the world for decades and decades. I can tell you, I was in a location in Hyderabad, India, 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago, in which they were drilling and finding water 12 to 15 feet below the surface. Today, the wells are abandoned at 700 feet because they've become too salty. They've run out of water. Well, you can see from this map all the serious water shortages around the world. Yet this is the internal solvent for public health. How do we run our sewer systems? How do we grow food? How do we have safe and clean water when you don't have water? And climate change is only going to continue to influence that because the runoff is going to often be massive events due to high, high volume, short-term rainfall that we're seeing already. So this is going to be a challenge for public health. And then this one probably is the one that really is the most concerning in many ways. This is a map showing the fragile state status of 178 countries in the world. And anything here from warning on, which you see there with the yellow, is actually a country that is literally on the potential edge of destabilization or not able to govern its population. When you look at that map, just know that 75 of the 178, excuse me, 95 of the 178 countries up here right now are in warning or more severe. That's 80% of the world's population live in a government country where basically it's relatively unstable. Try to do public health in those kinds of conditions. Two years ago, I published a book, and I'm not here to try to sell it, only to say it's the framework for which I look at this, Deadliest Enemy, Our War Against Killer Germs. And frankly, it was a love letter from my perspective to my kids and grandkids. What do I have left to give them? What can we do with this world that we live in now for the future? And in that, I came up with nine priority areas. The first two really are the only two that I consider of pandemic potential, an epidemic of worldwide proportions. Influenza will come back over and over again. And antimicrobial resistance, why it's not one bug kind of situation, it is a, a, a truly a pandemic in terms of all the collective resistance we're seeing. And then we get into the diseases of critical regional importance that can have major impact in a region like Ebola, like Zika, mosquitoes are clearly important, bioterrorism, all of these areas are ones we have to address. 
But let me today concentrate really on those top ones to give you a sense of the challenges we have. And I know that uh, Sonia and Jim will be following up in similar fashion with these diseases. This is an op-ed piece I wrote in the New York Times several years ago saying, you know, the real threat to national security is deadly disease. Let me just say, if we had a severe pandemic today and we basically couldn't bring those drugs from China here because manufacturing was shut down, transportation was shut down, this would make a war seem kind of not so bad. That's a pretty hard thought to think about. So, in fact, we have to begin looking at national security and these infectious diseases. Ask the developing world countries, the low-income countries of the world that have had Ebola outbreaks, that have had severe uh, uh, cholera outbreaks, what this means to them. This is a report that was done by the World Health Organ or, uh, um, the United Nations right after the 2013-15 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, in which they basically concluded, my God, public health is really in dire straits globally. We are not well prepared to deal with many of the crises we have today. And the panel chair actually wrote the following. Following the extensive consultation, the panel notes that the high risk of major health crises is, is widely underestimated. The world's preparedness and capacity to respond is woefully insufficient. Future epidemics could far exceed the scale and devastation of the West Africa Ebola outbreak. The panel was very concerned to learn that the emergence of a highly pathogenic influenza virus, which could readily or rapidly result in millions of deaths and cause major social, economic, and political disruption is not an unlikely scenario. Well, it's not just flu. Flu is clearly the leader. I don't think we quite get the fact that as many steps as we've taken forward in public health and infectious diseases, the last 20 to 30 years, we've taken many, many steps backwards. Ebola is an example. You're going to hear more about that from our speakers uh, coming. But again, it's a wildlife disease in parts of Africa uh, for which when that spills over into humans, of course, we see this type of hemorrhagic disease. This was the 2013-15 uh, epidemic in the three Western uh, African countries that redefined Ebola. When you think about it, what happened? Well, if you can read in the third paragraph up there, it says, you know, what happened? Did the virus change? No, it didn't. Africa changed. And the urbanization of Africa, as we see the urbanization much of the world, has fundamentally changed how infectious diseases happen. What happens? In this paper that we published, uh, our group, uh, with a number of international experts, at the same time of the 2013-14 outbreak, we reviewed all the previous 24 Ebola epidemics that had occurred between 1976 and 2013. Only 2,400 cases in all those 24 outbreaks. And they were easily contained. Today, why is it that we're still fighting a second Ebola outbreak that is challenging us immensely after West Africa? Again, Africa's changed as so has the world. This is the epidemiologic curve for the current epidemic that's in the DRC, one that has had 3,313 deaths as of this morning, uh, 2,215, or cases, 2,215 deaths. And it looks good in the sense, oh my gosh, it looks like it's ending. And we were hopeful that we were bringing it to an end after all the social unrest that occurred and made it difficult to contain. But look at what's happened here. If you follow this, you can actually see, as we report out by date from SIDRAP News, this one in November, Ebola cases hit 3,285 as transmission rate slows. People were getting optimistic. We are down to two, one case a day. But then all of a sudden, the violence erupted again. You can see here in, in November uh, or December what happened where new vi uh, violence suspends Ebola response in a key hotspot area. Again, we had more security. We're so close, but we're beginning to lose it because we're shutting down our operations. More violence continues to stall the Ebola response in DRC hotspots as of just uh, very recently here. And then even more so, we actually had to pull complete staff out because they were being targeted. Last, the last two weeks, six Ebola workers were targeted and killed trying to do their work. And here it is right here in the two attacks. And so the challenge is right now, we don't know what's happening. Today there were five new cases reported. The problem is we don't have good reporting right now because everything's been shutting down. We were that close. I don't know which way this is going to go in the next two weeks. With the violence as it is, we could see a reoccurrence of the major Ebola epidemic. Maybe not. This isn't about vaccines, guys. This isn't about public health response. This is about security and what it is to do public health in a world like this. A report earlier this week, again, more snags for the Ebola situation. So this is the world we live in. 
Now flu, influenza is the one that I mentioned earlier, clearly is a major challenge for us. And influenza is at a point in human and animal history unlike any time it ever, ever has been. We all know that the primary reservoir for influenza viruses that then make their way to humans is avian species, primarily poultry today. And we know that when those viruses eventually change and get into a pig population where they change a little bit more or they get into humans, that's when the likelihood for a new pandemic strain or a strain that humans can be infected by and spread, but in fact, we don't have protection. Well, just look at these numbers here. This is remarkable. Today, we live in a chicken world. There are more chickens than any other mammal or avian species on the planet. Why? Because we need protein. Today, the conversion of energy is most effectively done in a chicken. 25 to 35 days out, that chicken's harvested, and that chicken breast is on your plate. So today, you can see up there, we're talking about 22 billion chickens in the earth. The next highest bird species has only 1.5 billion. To feed Shanghai, to feed the world, we now have this. And if you want to breed avian influenza viruses, just do this. Just watch what happens. It's remarkable. So we're sitting on the cusp of what could be one of the most dynamic periods of avian virus maturation and transmission to humans imaginable. And we can't forget what happened in 1918. I know this is of some debate with some. It's not among many of us. Let me remind you that in 1918, just like we saw in 2009, but fortunately in a much lower level, what killed people was what killed them young. And what killed them young was not bacterial infections. It was a cytokine storm. It was a condition that, frankly, we don't do a hell of a lot better today in 2020 than we did in 1918. And so we're not, if we have another one of those events, and I might add, just to give you a sense, the average age of deaths in, two, in 2009 with H1N1 was actually younger when adjusted for life expectancy than 1918. Think about that. A H1N1 strain, what it does. So we are primed, potentially, for more large and very, very disruptive and potentially very uh, consequential pandemics. We have reviewed the 1918 pandemic, and we warned that it's a global threat. You've got to take this seriously. And yet most of the world has had very little preparation for this. We published a paper in 2011 that almost, I thought, was going to get me burned at the stake. Um, I, my name was thrown out there at the time with uh, the dear gentleman who gave us measles and autism, in which we challenged how well flu vaccines worked. And it had not to do with anybody intentionally misrepresented them. They didn't understand how to measure outcome for flu. They were using serology, which turned out it didn't work well. And we found that, you know what, that 70, 90 percent is not true. If you get 50 percent, that's a good year. In many years, you'll get zero. Just like last year with H3N2, H1N1, one of them gave us 48 percent protection. The other one gave us zero. Now, it's still the best we have. I've been vaccinated, I get my vaccine, but don't count on it being the answer. And more importantly, don't count on the world having access to it. In every one of the pandemics to date, it's always arrived after the second big wave. I don't see how that's going to change much in the future. So until we change that, that's going to be a big, huge problem. The good news is, is there's now finally a lot of work going on trying to move this forward. This is a piece in today's New England Journal of Medicine, preparing for the next pandemic, the WHO's Global Influence influenza strategy. I'd like to say my colleagues at WHO, thank you for this, um, but it's not very meaningful. Industry is really where the action's at, and industry can only produce probably 400,000 or 400 million doses of vaccine for the 7.7 billion people in the first 6 to 12 months, with the pandemic will already hit and been gone. So we need to work on this area. It's a huge area of, a, of importance. One area I also just want to mention briefly is antimicrobial resistance. This paper is, to me, one of the most fascinating pieces in all of science. This is a study that a group did in the far, far reaches of Carlsbad Caverns, where they went in over back where no human had been in three million years, and they cultured the walls aseptically for, to see what they could find for microbes, and they found a lot of them. And they found that they were resistant up to 14 of the current commercially available antibiotics. You say, well, how can that be? They had no access to them. Well, microbes have been fighting for space and food since the beginning of time. And each time, a mutation which frequently occurs in their uh, reproductive stages 
means that something bad happens to them and they die, or something good happens and they beat out the guy next to them because now my cell wall isn't affected by that chemical you put out, and in fact the chemical I put out now is going to kill you. That's antimicrobial resistance. And it turns out that we, before we ever made the first antibiotic, already had a challenge. Antibiotic resistance is global, global evolution at its finest. So please don't think that we can outsmart the bugs this way. We're living in an era where we're just borrowing time with the antibiotics that we have developed and used. This is a report that was published by the AMR group in England two and a half years ago. Sir Jim O'Neill uh, led this effort, uh, by, commissioned by the British government and supported by the Wellcome Trust, and it was by far the most comprehensive review of antimicrobial resistance anywhere it's ever been done. And in this particular report, they laid out very clearly all the different organisms that we need to be concerned about, and some of them they didn't even have on there at the time, but today, for example, there's a fungus to today that we worry greatly about this resistant. But what was also telling is, to give some perspective to this, they predicted that by 2050, there'd be more deaths from antimicrobial resistance, as you can see, than cancer and diabetes combined worldwide, adjusted for age. Think about that. We've been all talking about chronic diseases, which are really important, but we are losing the power of antibiotics that gave us those 45 to 78 year life expectancy changes, in part. This report was reviewed two months ago at a meeting at Chatham House in London, and to say everyone was disappointed by the world's response was an understatement. And look at the last sentence up there. The antimicrobial resistance by 2050 could result in 10 million people dying with an economic impact of $100 trillion. And you know what? It's like climate change today which while there are activists and there are groups, we're losing the battle on climate change. You know, we've got greenhouse gas levels now we haven't seen in three million years. And we aren't taking this seriously. Well, what does that mean? I don't know if I'll go here yet to say that the post-antibiotic era is here, but we're getting closer and closer every day. The easy antibiotics are gone. Today, commercially, nobody wants to make an antibiotic if you're a pharmaceutical company, because we tell you don't use it unless you absolutely need to, which does not a lot of things for your sales. It's like trying to you know, sell a car that is the best running, best looking, safest, most fuel efficient car, but you can only drive it on Sunday from 9 to 9.30 a.m. Nobody buys it. So today we can't get the industry interested in these antibiotics. This is one huge one we have to deal with. Let me just say a couple of comments about mosquitoes, the absolutely most dangerous creature on earth in terms of human and animal health. This is probably the saddest commentary on the fluid nature of public health preparedness. If I were to ask you this question, I'm sure most of you might not think this is the answer, but the very first country in the world to eliminate malaria from its populous regions was Venezuela. They beat the United States in 1964. They beat the United States. Today, Venezuela is in such free fall. Doctors, nurses, architects don't have work, so what do they do? They end up going out into the illegal gold mines in the jungles where they do pick up malaria, they bring it back to the major metropolitan areas. Today we have the largest outbreaks of urbanized malaria in the history of the world in Venezuela. How can we go from eliminating it to now the worst in the world? That shows you the importance of maintaining public health preparedness. This is by far the most dangerous of mosquitoes, you might say, in terms of, of the number of the newer diseases we talk about. When I came into the business in 1975 at the university here, I was told by many, why the hell are you going into infectious diseases? It's the coarse and buggy stuff. Well, if you look at that map, you can see where Aedes aegypti was located in the 1930s and what PAHO and the Rockefeller Foundation had done by 1970. This is a mosquito that won't fly across a city street or an open field. It's a mosquito that's a daytime biter, bites you in the back of the neck, back of the elbows, back of the knees, you don't feel it, and it loves to live in dark, cloistered areas and little bodies of water, like what might be in a water vessel or a piece of plastic that holds a little bit of water. That's it. Look what happened. By 2015, look at where Aedes aegypti is today. And not only is it there, but it's in population levels anywhere from 100 to 500 times what it was even in the 1930s. Is this public health progress? Well, when we talk about diseases like yellow fever and dengue and Zika, chikungunya, now you start to think about what does this all mean? And it's these kinds of environments today. For the couple of you in the room old enough to remember the graduate, what did we tell Benjamin to go into? Plastics. Well, 
it's not the water the pigs are in, it's all that tire and plastics back there. It's the plastics on one of the most popular beaches for the Olympics several years ago. It's the plastics that are in every urbanized area and many rural areas. And that's where we have to think about, sorry, think about what we're looking for for the future. Let me just close off with uh, clearly the issue of where we're going today with the whole area of vaccine hesitancy. There can be no greater, again, immediate failure that we can imagine than what's happened with measles. I grew up in a world of measles before the first measles vaccine, and what, we had kids my age die. But many of you in this room have not ever had to worry about that. Well, today, because of vaccine hesitancy, one of the top 10 priorities that WHO has launched for this year, we are now seeing major, major challenges with measles. This is the worldwide measles epidemic that, by the way, it's in the down phase right on that far right side, but no, that's a season, when it's seasonally adjusted. And when you look, we're already at over 440,000 cases of measles for this year, and by the time world reporting catches up, and we know many don't get reported, it'll be much higher. Later today, the WHO, tomorrow, Friday, their time, are going to be announcing that they have now concluded that last year alone, over 140,000 individuals in the world died from measles. Died from measles something no one should die from. And yet, look how far we've slipped back. More importantly, don't forget, and I tried to detail this in my book, what kills us versus what hurts us versus what concerns us, what scares the hell out of us, is all very different many times. 2,200 people have died from Ebola over the course of this Ebola outbreak in DRC. 4,400, or now 4,500 kids have died from measles in the same area at the same time. Did you ever be dying from measles there? We all talked about Ebola, but the infrastructure doesn't exist, and so these kids were dying of measles. Six nations now report polio cases this past week. 18 different countries have reported polio this past year. We thought we were going to eliminate it, eradicate it out of everywhere. Today, it's at the highest level it's been in years. Again, why? Well, 110 Pakistani Polio eradicators have all been assassinated in the last two years trying to deliver polio vaccine in Pakistan. Think about that. It's a whole new world order. Let me just conclude by saying, as Sir Winston Churchill once said, it's no use saying we're doing our best. You've got to succeed in doing what is necessary. If any of you want to get in the fight against infectious disease and public health, now is the time. If there's ever been a need for a renaissance, if there's ever been a need to reestablish our ability to respond to infectious diseases, it's now. It's going to be very different than I first knew when I got into the business. A lot of additional challenges. But I'm telling you, as, as I've shared with you throughout, we will deal with infectious diseases for the decades to come. And, if, and how public health responds to that will determine a lot about how that love letter to my kids and grandkids plays out. Thank you. So now that, now that uh, Mike has scared you all kind of uh, to death, I'm going to kind of change, change it a little bit here. So I've, uh, as Susan said, for the last 30 years, I've been largely doing research in infectious diseases, uh, for the most part HIV. Uh, but I want to talk to you about doing research during an Ebola epidemic. Uh, and I, and, and I, I guess the, the, the thing I want you to think about is that the only way that we're going to understand the efficacy and safety of, say, vaccines and treatments for infectious diseases like Ebola is to do research in the epidemic. Uh, and so people have kind of, you, you may have heard, HIV is touted uh, because in a very short period of time, you know, from the 80s to the mid-90s, uh, where HIV was a death sentence, people are now living much longer. How fast that occurred. And so uh, you don't have as much time during an Ebola epidemic uh, to do the research. So uh, as Mike mentioned, e Ebola is an interesting infection. Uh, it, you can trace it back to a number of outbreaks between 1976 and 2008. Uh, among these outbreaks, the largest involved 425 infections and 225 deaths. They were largely contained. 
Then what happened was the West African 2014-15 outbreak, over 28,000 infections, over 11,000 deaths. And, and, and there's a reason for that. Uh, it will be apparent from my next slide, if not already, from what Mike talked about, uh, kind of where this epidemic hit uh, in the populations uh, in, the, in the large cities uh, in this area. We're now experiencing kind of another kind of epidemic of Ebola. And kind of what's interesting to me, and, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it again when I talk about one of the trials that we've done, is that uh, this may be a disease where you, know, you, you, you don't complete the research in one epidemic and you just hold off to the next one. And we definitely tried to weigh that issue uh, in 2015 and actually stopped a trial before we had conclusive answers, thinking this isn't going to happen again for a while. Well, it, it did uh, not too long uh, later. And I put a, a star here because uh, this outbreak is, as Mike indicated, it's uncertain when it's going to end. So uh, the 2014-15 outbreak occurred in a small town. A young girl uh, can be traced back to December 2013. Uh, that was confirmed in a report later in March. Uh, and what, what I wanted to point out from this slide is that it occurred right on the border between three countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, and the borders there are very fluid. People would walk back and forth, and you, know, you didn't know which country you were in. Uh, and ultimately, uh, this infection uh, hit all three capitals, uh, Conakry, Freetown, and, and Monrovia. Uh, and that's where the devastation kind of uh, was paramount. So that uh, in September, uh, of 2014, we at the University of Minnesota were asked to kind of uh, provide support uh, for the design and the conduct of trials uh, on Ebola uh, in Liberia. Uh, there's been a long-standing relationship between Liberia and the United States. Uh, in August, uh, the Ministry of Health uh, sent our Secretary of Human Health and Human Services a request for support in doing research. Uh, NIH responded in September, uh, and I went over with a group of people from NIH in 2014, and this was the situation. Uh, very little infrastructure remained after the Civil Wars. There wasn't much there to begin with. Uh, I have not been to Kenosha, but uh, two of my colleagues have been, Mike, and they basically have said that Kenosha is incredibly great, better than Monrovia, uh, and also Freetown and Conakry. This is an extremely poor area of the world. Uh, in October, when I was there, there were already 3,000 people infected. Uh, the World Health Organization hadn't declared a public health emergency uh, until August. And so that a lot had happened uh, between the confirmation of this girl, young girl with having the case of Ebola in December uh, to kind of August that largely went unnoticed by most of the world, but we were well into the epidemic already uh, in, in all three countries, and there were 3,000 infections in Liberia. There were Ebola treatment units uh, around the capital, and there were 250 people there. Uh, during this epidemic, roughly 50 to 60 percent of the people that went into an Ebola treatment unit did not survive. Uh, it was a state of emergency, schools were closed, and another important point that I wanted to highlight is that we were at a stage uh, when we began this work, uh, there were no licensed treatments for either the prevention of Ebola or the kind of treatment of Ebola. Uh, so that kind of we, we need to kind of plan well in advance of when these epidemics begin for the drug development and the vaccine development. And as you might expect, uh, in a country like this, there were many misconceptions and doubts and kind of about the disease as well as are we going to be, what kind of investigational treatments might you be using? So this collaboration, which a month or two later after October, uh, when we had developed the protocols, became known as PREVAIL, the Partnership for Research on Ebola Virus in Liberia, uh, we, set, we established three priorities. Uh, get a vaccine trial going as rapidly as possible. Uh, follow it immediately with a treatment trial, and plan a cohort study of the survivors of Ebola uh, to understand the long-term complications of the infection, 
research really which not, had not been done in the smaller pre previous ep epidemics and actually has proved to be very useful because uh, there's some understanding now of how even survivors of Ebola may transmit the infection uh, to others and basically start another kind of epidemic. So I, I put the kinds of things that were, were considered, and these are the kind of the, the logical things to think about when you're doing any kind of study of investigational agents, but I put them here because the, the goal in considering them is to get reliable evidence as rapidly as possible so that you can basically inform, practice, and guide future, kind of the future treatment prevention of the disease. Uh, randomization, which treatment and control group do you use? Can you blind the study? What's your target population? Uh, I'll come back to that because I know Sonia may talk about that a little bit in her presentation. How much data can you collect and how, could you, how should you monitor the data to end the trial as soon as possible? So in this epidemic, uh, there were five treatment trials. And of the five treatment trials, one was randomized. This is the one we did. Uh, there were three vaccine trials, one in Sierra Leone, one in Guinea, and one in Liberia. And there was not good collaboration among the groups doing the vaccine trials. And so, and they, and they were designed differently. The vaccine trials all had an element of randomization in it. One was placebo controlled, the one I'll show you, the others were not. Uh, so the, the vaccine trial uh, that we designed was a, a, a phase two, three trial. I'll define that in just a moment, but it included two vaccines, one from Merck and one from GSK, without going into the long names for you, uh, versus a common placebo group. Uh, and this began on February 2nd, so I want to keep, keep that timeline in mind. We met for the first time uh, near Halloween in October, and we began on February 2nd uh, a trial with two, two experimental vaccines. There were limited safety data available. Uh, there were none from a West African population. As a matter of fact, if you read the background section of the protocol for the vaccine trial, we, 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 we cite phase one studies which have not been completed and which have not even been unblinded. So we, we knew there were no serious adverse events among the 24 patients in the phase one trial, but we didn't know in terms of the uh, immunogenicity data uh, what the results were by treatment group or how the adverse events kind of that were of lesser severity varied by treatment group. We decided uh, after a lot of discussion, uh, in, in, when you look at eligibility criteria, it's a, it, in, in large part, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing of risk versus benefit. So here the risk even though in the middle of an epidemic of acquiring Ebola was relatively low. Uh, and for that reason, because of the absence of, uh, of uh, safety data, uh, except in adults largely seen in the US uh, and in Europe, we, we restricted the trial uh, to adults, uh, men and women, but not children and women who were pregnant or, or were breastfeeding. Uh, this was a, a, a long discussion uh, about this and one that we still have about doing vaccine trials, which you may hear more from Sonia in her presentation. Now, on the other hand, when we designed the, the treatment trial, uh, there, there was no licensed therapy, and rather than placebo or doing it blinded, we basically defined the control group as optimized standard of care. And the major reason for that was that this was an injectable drug called ZMAP, and the injection itself put staff, clinical staff at risk uh, in kind of in taking care of people with Ebola, which is transmitted through you know, bodily fluids. Again, there was very limited safety data, uh, uh, kind of human safety data uh, on this vaccine. There was anecdotal information from eight patients who had been treated by compassionate use. There was a phase one study that had just been ongoing, but, and there was a limited supply of the drug. I mean, those are all considerations, I think, that led us to do a randomized trial uh, with a standard of control, control arm 
and essentially to take all comers. Uh, the, so we, in this trial, the risk-benefit clearly, because the death rate was 50 to 60 percent, clearly favored putting everybody in, even though the data was not there for children or for pregnant women or other kind of individuals uh, that, that, that potentially were at higher risk. And so uh, all, all the, the participants, all, all the potentially eligible participants with Ebola were, were eligible for randomization. This trial, uh, because of a, a waning epidemic in Liberia, got moved to Sierra Leone and, Liber and, 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 and Guinea. Uh, but I just want to point out this, this, the trial protocol was actually open in the United States. The very first patient randomized was in the United States, uh, and the second one was in Liberia, where it, we began the trial. So these were kind of uh, design issues, which I think su went surprisingly well to, 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 in, in our discussions with people at the Ministry of Health uh, in Liberia. Uh, in other settings, uh, and you may have read about it, uh, absolutely no randomization, absolutely no placebo. Uh, you know, and so here we had a group of people who uh, basically very quickly agreed at 40,000 feet, you might say, at what the overall trial design should be. Uh, both randomized trials, uh, one kind of double blind and the other not. And then the focus here became kind of implementation. And I just wanted to mention a few of these because it, it highlights the importance of preparedness. <laughs> Uh, and what we had to do in terms of getting, doing these trials and beginning a trial uh, in, in essentially three months uh, following initial discussions with the Liberian uh, Ministry of Health. So one question might be is how do you prepare syringes without clean rooms or freezers and provide them to sites within a few hours? So much like the safety data, which didn't exist, stability information of the vaccine, once you had filled the syringe, also was lacking. So both companies, Merck and GSK, felt that to be safe, the vaccine should be used within three or four hours. So what we did? Well, we went to the embassy. We had an incredible ambassador uh, who was very kind of uh, helpful. She gave us a, an old building on what they call the old embassy grounds. We quickly renovated it. Uh, we bought uh, hoods, we bought freezers, uh, and the vaccine arrived one week prior to starting the study. And I, and I mention that because even if we had moved faster in terms of the design and the kind of renovation and the work pre preparing to begin, it would not have been possible to start because the vaccines weren't ready to be shipped. And so, uh, this, the, the picture on the right uh, is a picture of six Liberian pharmacists uh, that were trained by a pharmacist from NIH and a pharmacist from the FDA. Uh, every morning they showed up at 6 o'clock. They pre prepared the syringes uh, to provide for the, vac for the randomization and the vaccination, uh, and they were delivered uh, to the vaccination site. So uh, how do you conduct a phase 2, 3 trial uh, with how to clinical laboratory and examining rooms. So I failed to mention earlier that in what I mean by phase two, three is that th there was no way we could felt like we could vaccinate 30 to 40,000 people was what we had estimated was going to be required without doing a run-in safety study uh, to make certain that the vaccines were safe. Uh, and so the phase two part of it was to include 600 people to understand the safety of the vaccines uh, before we kind of did them on a more widespread uh, basis. So we chose to do the phase two study at, at Redemption Hospital. Uh, and Redemption Hospital actually turned out was the, uh, a place where most healthcare workers in, Lib in Monrovia lost their lives. Uh, and uh, the people who ran that hospital, it's a free hospital, uh, the typical kind of uh, uh, number of people you might see in a day uh, there in that hospital is over a thousand people. It's spread out. It looks small, but it's actually a spread out in environment. Uh, when we visited in October, there was no one there. Actually, the, there were four or five clinical staff, and they were watching TV. Basically, most all the healthcare facilities uh, in Monrovia had closed down and people were afraid to go there because that's where people died. Uh, and that's actually where a number of uh, healthcare workers died. 
So we, in order to do this study, we built a lab uh, in December, uh, brought in the equipment, uh, got it running so we could do the laboratory screening that was necessary for the vaccine uh, and remodeled the space uh, showing the vaccination room there. So how do you obtain informed consent from a population that, that may not be able to read a consent form? So they actually had an ingenious idea, the Liberians. We're going to have a group session led by Liberians we're going to put pictures on the wall to show what's going to happen at each stage of the trial, and we're going to explain the trial to the group. And they would bring in like 20 or 25 people at a time. And if you've if met people from Liberia, and many of them live here in, in the Twin Cities area, uh, they like to talk and they like to argue. And they'd have, I mean, so if you ask, uh, if you stop and pause and say, does anybody have any questions? If there's 20 people in the audience, 15 of them, would, hands would go up. And so they actually would spend roughly an hour in these information sessions asking questions. After that, they went into a private room for individual informed consent. And I've mentioned to several people, I don't think I've ever seen such good informed consent, where there was actually lots of discussion about the trial and what they were getting into. How do you randomize people with no access to the internet? Uh, sometimes you don't even have electricity. In October, Almost all the meetings I went to at the ministry uh, were in the dark. Uh, electricity would go off for hours at a time. So we did, you know, the important things in terms of randomization. You know, you, you've heard of blinded randomization potentially. You don't want to have people know what the next assignment's going to be. And so what, what was done by the pharmacist in the upper left-hand corner there is they prepared syringes and put a barcoded label according to a randomization roll of labels that were, was prepared here in Minnesota. They then kind of, kind of filled the syringes. Before that, they had filled the syringes. Then they put them into a kind of a basket for transport to Redemption Hospital. And when they got to Redemption Hospital, we randomly pulled a, a, a syringe out of a bag and to vaccinate somebody. It had the really desirable feature because we use blocks of 12 and they would typically see 24 to 30 people a day, that if you looked at the paper that we published in this trial, there's almost a precise, well, there's exact allocation that, that we had desired. There's 500 on GSK's vaccine, 500 on Merck's, and 500 on placebo. And this was the case when you got randomized, you were vaccinated. So there's nobody that got randomized that wasn't vaccinated. And the linkage that was put on by the person in the vaccination room with a case report form was with the patient identifying information. And so nobody knew what that code corresponded to except statisticians back here at Minnesota, but the linkage with the patient was established there on the form so one could produce the summary reports for an advisory committee monitoring the safety of the trial. How do you ensure a good follow-up? Well, the best thing that kind of I found out on the first trip is that the, there are a lot of people that the ministry had hired to track people with Ebola. And some of those individuals uh, have, no, have friends, and they'd also be willing to work for you. So we hired something like 50 trackers. And every t when people came into the kind of, uh, and were vaccinated, they were assigned a tracker who lived in their neighborhood they don't have addresses, so it's the general area where they lived, and that tracker checked on the participant every day. And that's how adverse events sometimes got reported, but that, more importantly, that's how we ensured good follow-up. Uh, the follow-up through one year, one year that we've reported here is something like 97% at every visit. Uh, anybody's envy of doing clinical trials with that kind of a follow-up. Uh, how do you collect data? You can't remove uh, anything from an ETU in a hot zone without a bleach bath. So this was a real challenge. We use schemes like this, and we use iPads, where the person standing in the hot zone and with an iPad would hold up a case report form they completed, and the person standing outside of the hot zone uh, would, would take a picture of it, and that's how the data became available. Or in, 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 instead, in, in some of the ETUs, the person in the hot zone would write the vital signs and the measurements we wanted on a board like this, and they would write them on the case report form outside of the ETU. It's a picture of uh, somebody in the hot zone uh, and then an area outside the hot zone where people could more safely uh, kind of stand. 
The waning epidemic was another challenge. And so uh, th this may be hard to see, but the red line there is Liberia. And so uh, if you can read the bottom, what you'll see is that the peak of this epidemic was when I was there for the first time at the end of October. And we started the trial a few months later, uh, kind of in February, where the epidemic was waning. And Liberia was the first country where the epidemic essentially was, the country was declared, declared Ebola free before Sierra Leone and Guinea. And so the, I, I show this because you know, we, we can't, even if we do this kind of research in the middle of epidemics, we can't wait to do all this kind of when the epidemic is at its peak. We need to be starting this kind of, the research needs to begin earlier and the vaccine development, as I mentioned, the treatment development needs to be done much, much earlier yet. Oops, sorry. So following, uh, at the end here, the following uh, these, uh, this epidemic, the National Academy of Science wrote a report, uh, which I think is actually worth reading. Uh, they made the following recommendations, and I, I don't want to take the time to go through them all, but, but three of them, or four of them here, I may just touch on briefly. One is to develop a sustainable health system. So we need something with research capacity that, so that you're not developing it when you go in there. Uh, resources for data collection and sharing need to kind of be established from the outset. Uh, actually, even today, unfortunately, it's easier to send specimens uh, from Mali, for example, that's participating in a vaccine trial we're doing, to the United States than it is to send from Mali to Liberia. It takes longer uh, because of not regulatory issues as well as uh, kind of country kind of uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, that, that, are, that, that needs to happen before you can do these things. Uh, incorporation of research in the national health systems and the coordination of international efforts and in research. As I mentioned, I don't think we were very well coordinated during 2014 to 2015. Uh, and you know, you, I don't think anybody's at fault for that. I think everybody rushed in at the last minute and did the best they could, uh, but we need to learn from that experience. So let me just tell you about the setting in, 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 in Liberia in October 2019. And so multiple hospitals and clinics remodeled, and so there's an there's a infrastructure building, including an imaging center, that's being left there. There's a new public health institute which has been established to kind of oversee some of the local research on infectious diseases and other conditions. We've been training statisticians and data management people here at the University of Minnesota. There's one statistician in Liberia that's been working with us. That, that is the only person we know really that's trained as a biostatistician with a master's degree in that entire country. More training is desperately needed. Eight protocols have been developed, uh, and the protocols now have expanded beyond Ebola uh, to also look at HIV and malaria. So they're building within these protocols uh, the, the understanding of how to do research. And lastly, uh, re related to the international coordination, uh, a West African partnership, a study called PREVAC, uh, a vaccine trial that ends enrollment uh, uh, and follow-up for the first year, uh, this month actually, uh, uh, over, over 4,000 people, including children, uh, is, is been developed and it's illustrated in this slide, which is very different than what happened during 2014, 2015. So this is a co collaboration among the French, the British, the Americans, uh, Guinea, Mali, Sierra Leone, uh, and Liberia, as well as you know, academic organizations like the University of Minnesota and the University of Bordeaux in France, as well as the companies that are providing the drug. So in conclusion here, I just want to say that you know, I think we've established that you can do scientifically rigorous and ethically sound research uh, in these resource-poor limited settings. Uh, randomization is possible, blinding is possible, good data collection is possible, high-quality research can result. I think this is further illustrated with the recent publication last week 
of the treatment trial in the DRC, a comparison of four treatments for Ebola, which built on the findings from the study that was somewhat inconclusive that we did uh, during the 2014-15 epidemic, but now we have two treatments uh, for Ebola uh, that uh, appear to be very good. And the recommendations on building capacity infrastructure have begun to be implemented uh, in, in West Africa as a whole, not only Liberia. I just want to show you these are pictures of the Prevail team in December of 2014. It's how we celebrated Christmas. Uh, and in Freetown, uh, the Prevac team on uh, March 2019. And there's a number of people here at the University of Minnesota who've been involved and made this happen. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to stand up here and speak for them. Uh, Kevin Riley has been kind of the, a right-hand person for everything we've been doing here. I've highlighted the people in bold uh, who, who agreed to go over there at various times with me. Uh, and, you know, it was a bit scary. Uh, and we didn't twist any arms, but a lot of people uh, spent time there, spent time working with people, educating them about kind of doing research, uh, and I think it's paid off. So thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. It's been a really fantastic day. The whole meeting's been wonderful. I really enjoyed this morning, and I'm going to be a healthier eater soon. So, <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about making the case that there are certain populations we all need to prepare for a future pandemic, for future epidemics. All of us are vulnerable in these situations, but I think certain populations, there are special considerations that need to be made. And I'm going to make the case for pregnant women, but I really think you could fill in children or a number of other categories um, in my uh, talk as well. So um, I'm a pediatrician and a clinical geneticist, and so I really came late to infectious disease. Um, I was really sitting at CDC doing studies trying to understand causes of birth effects and really looking at medications and does obesity cause birth effects, does do SSRIs cause birth effects. I was doing studies like that. When this paper was published in the MMWR, um, it was reporting a case, a woman who had had West Nile virus during her second trimester of pregnancy. And this is at the time that West Nile virus was really spreading across the country. And what we saw was there was a baby born that had really significant birth effects. Um, uh, severe problems with the brain and with the eyes, exactly what you would expect from what we know of other infectious diseases that cause birth effects from CMV, toxoplasmosis, et cetera. And so I started getting un interested in what happens to women when they have infections during pregnancy and do their babies have birth effects? And I started really doing a lot of reading and a lot of writing. I worked with the colleagues at CDC to study West Nile. So you can see that there's a couple of papers there about West Nile virus. I started working with um, my favorite uh, co-author, Denise Jamison. She's an OBGYN and I'm a pediatrician, so we made a good team. We published several papers on emerging infections and pregnancy in general. And then we, we had kind of a theme, and we do measles in pregnancy, LCMV in pregnancy. We went through a long list, and it, it was a, um, a really fun um, way to study infectious disease. I learned about a lot of infectious diseases really quickly. And I want to point out the paper um, that uh, one of my colleagues, Ned Hayes, and I wrote um, in 2005. And we were looking at what are the challenges to um, emerging effects and infections among pregnant women. And these are the things that we came up with. And I'm going to go through some of these in uh, some of the responses that I later worked on at CDC. Because once I caught the bug of working on these responses, I wanted to work on them a lot. So um, first of all, pregnant women might be more susceptible to infection or might have an increased risk of dying, getting really sick or dying. And we certainly knew that that was true um, for some infections. And we know that women, when you get pregnant, your immune system has to change. Otherwise, you can't tolerate that uh, fetus that has antigens from the dad on it. The only way to tolerate it is to change your immune system. And that makes you more susceptible to certain infections. Um, emerging infections in women could cause adverse effects in the embryo or fetus, even when a maternal uh, infection is mild or asymptomatic. We knew that from, for example, rubella, that women can have a relatively mild infection, or CMV. You can really be basically asymptomatic, but your baby can have pretty severe effects. Prophylaxis and treatment of emerging infections may be contraindicated in pregnant women. Um, 
and the effects of the emerging infection are on the embryo or fe fetus are often unknown, are difficult to predict, and can present long time after birth. And certainly, we knew that from CMV again, that sometimes a baby can look totally normal at birth and several months later can present with hearing loss or developmental disabilities. And of course, now we're seeing that now with Zika too. And then diagnosis of emerging infections in the embryo, fetus, or infant is often difficult, and certainly um, it depends on getting the right specimens at the right time, and we certainly learn that later about Zika. So I just want to bring you back to this time in 2005. Um, this was a, um, a speech that George W. Bush uh, gave at the NIH. It is vital that our nation discuss and address the threat of pandemic flu now. There is no pandemic flu in our country or in the world at this time, but if we wait for a pandemic to appear, it will be too late to prepare. And one day many lives could be needlessly lost because we failed to act today. And um, here you can see um, from SIDRAP, uh, Bush asks for $7.1 to prepare for the flu pandemic. Because of that, there was a lot of interest in pandemic flu in the country and at CDC. And I started thinking, what's going to happen with pregnant women when there's a, a flu outbreak? So um, just to go through why was there a lot of concern, why had there beca become concern from uh, President Bush and from others? What happens when there's a pandemic? You have to have a new virus that the population is immunologically basically naive to. The virus has to cause serious illness. If, the, if it's not that serious of an illness, it doesn't really matter. And then it has to spread easily to, from person to person. And if you look at this time, there had been H5N1, um, a bird flu virus or avian flu, um, identified uh, in uh, the late uh, 1990s. And then you can see in 2005, there was probable person-to-person -person transmission of that H5N1. And so there was a lot of concern for preparing for that H5N1 to eventually develop the ability to spread easily from person to person and to come to the United States. Little did we know it was actually gonna be something from uh, California and Mexico instead. So also, and you heard about this from Dr. Osterholm, um, we hadn't had a pandemic in a while. So I think people felt like we were overdue. Of course, there's the 1918 pandemic that you heard about the effects that it had on the mortality rate, 1957 and 1968. So we started talking, and I talked with my friend um, Denise Jameson and Joe Brzee. Um, Joe is an expert on flu, Denise is an OBGYN, and we started writing this paper, and we published it in January 2008. Really, we didn't give any answers to these issues. We brought up a lot of concerns that pregnant women would get sicker. We knew from previous pandemics, and we knew from um, seasonal flu that pregnant women got more sick when they got flu. They were more likely to be hospitalized. We also knew from um, that that women are don't want to be injecting this. They don't want to get a flu vaccine during pregnancy. You know, when you're pregnant, you're not even supposed to take a Tylenol. You know, why would I get a flu vaccine? Even though flu vaccine had been recommended for many, many years for pregnant women, only about 25% of women were getting it at, at that time. And we were worried that, you know, as you heard, the, flu, the vaccine doesn't become available right away. Um, once it becomes available, you want women to get it because they're at high risk. The other thing is that we knew very little about Tamiflu at that time. We knew very little about Oseltamivir, um, about how it affected pregnant women. And so we raised these issues, um, we published it, and then people started saying, well, what are you going to do about it? And um, I said, let's have a meeting. So um, we um, did, those are the issues we brought up. We had this meeting, and the meeting was held in April of 2008. And I think this really ended up being, you know, it was exactly a year before the pandemic really hit, but it was actually a very helpful meeting in that we brought experts. We brought in about 50 experts. I had, had gotten people to give me money from across CDC to have this meeting. We brought in about 50 experts, but we also brought in key partners, and I think when I think of the, the um, other responses that I've been involved in, that the fact that we had had people from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, we'd had people from the American Academy of Pediatrics, we'd had several representatives from state health departments there, they had already given us input into our plans, into what we were talking about, and sometimes we weren't sure what the right thing. Should we say Tamiflu, give Tamiflu to pregnant women or not? Should we give it first, second, and third trimester, or is, is it higher risk, second, and third trimester? 
trimester. So we discussed all these things with those other people in the room, the people that were going to be necessary for implementing the project later on or the, the um, response later on. So um, I began very quickly writing this paper up after the meeting got done, and unfortunately it got kind of stuck, any of you that have been part of a special issue. Um, it was part of a special issue. The special issue always is stuck till the very last person finishes their paper. And I got the galley proofs from that paper the same week that, the, um, that the, this paper appeared in the MMWR, the two cases were seen in California. And so you could say, well, that's a little late, but the good news is American Journal of Public Health agreed immediately to place it online. They placed the um, paper online, and we did have those recommendations ready. So we weren't sitting there at the time the, the response started, after those cases were out there, we weren't sitting there saying, well, should we, should we say Tamalhu, yes or no? We already knew what we were going to say. So um, just bring you back. Then this was my first experience in the CDC Emergency Operations Center. This is where you go when there's a big response at CDC, and um, I've now spent a lot of time there between um, several different responses. Um, and you, this looks like a big room. There's actually, uh, when there's a big response like Zika or Ebola, um, every conference room on the 12 floors of the building there are filled with people right one next to each other. We've always thought, especially during H1N1, that it maybe wasn't the best as far as preventing flu. So, um, so these first two cases were identified on April 15th and 17th, and, and they weren't kids that were particularly sick, and they were actually identified um, as part of a CDC study. And um, here you can see April 15th, April 17th, Oh, gosh, a lot already more, right? There's cases now in Texas on April 24th and cases in Mexico, and then April 28th, just four days later. So this very quickly spread across the United States and across the world. And um, we began immediately trying to collect data um, because we wanted to be sure that we had made the correct recommendations. We wanted to alter our recommendations if we got data that suggested that what we had recommended wasn't right. So um, we published these two papers. The first one in, was in May. It was after um, uh, the second person to die in the United States of H1N1 was a healthy pregnant woman, and we wanted to get that information out there. Um, at first, people, you know, in the news, they were saying, oh, she had severe asthma. You know, when we looked at her medical records, she'd had, a, had asthma as a child. You know, she had had no problems with asthma, no meds. She was just unlucky to be pregnant at the time that a pandemic hit. So, and then we published this later paper in The Lancet. So um, what we found, what we published in those papers, there were 34 cases in that first month of U.S. pregnant women. I just want to emphasize these are data that we collected because the state health departments were willing to work with us. These aren't data that CDC collects on our own. Um, the state health departments collect that information and send it to us, so we're totally dependent on them. Um, there were infections and deaths in all three trimesters, and that really helped us to say, okay, the decision we made to say Tamiflu, even in the first trimester, was right. Pregnant women were more likely to be hospitalized, about four times more likely to be hospitalized. They were more likely to die, and most of the women who died were previously healthy. The other thing we noticed is that even though we had that information out there right away, we'd said if you suspect flu, and the woman is pregnant, start her on Tamiflu. We noticed that a lot of women weren't getting Tamiflu in a timely manner. Sometimes they weren't going to their doctors. Sometimes they were going to their doctors and their doctors were sending a flu test, which took a couple days. And the best thing is to get Tamiflu in the first 48 hours. So we really redoubled our efforts to get the message out. So um, this is a paper we published in JAMA in uh, April of the next year. And what we found here is that about 5% of deaths in the United States from H1N1 were among pregnant women, whereas pregnant women really only make up about 1% of the general population. So they were making up a disproportionate number of deaths. The other thing we noted is that early treatment was associated with fewer admissions to the intensive care unit and fewer deaths. And this is one line. We looked at this about 10 different ways, and there's a big table in the JAMA paper, but this is one line that's in there. Um, if you compare women who were treated more than four days after symptom onset versus in the first couple days after the symptom onset, they were six times more likely to be admitted to the intensive care unit and more than 50 times more likely to die. 
So um, now you see that there's large confidence intervals. That's a good thing because that means there weren't very many deaths. But still, I think even if you go on the lower end of the confidence interval, you'd say that it was the right decision to, to treat women. So um, this is just an example about 2009 H1N1. Um, I think this has come up, and so since then, I, I really did enjoy working in infectious disease. I enjoyed working on infectious disease responses. I worked on H7 and 9, H3 and 2 variant, um, uh, MERS and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, Ebola and Zika, and then I left CDC, and I'll be really sad when there's the next response, so that I'm gone. But, um, um, but I just want to say that in, in several of the later responses, issues with pregnant women came up again. So when Ebola hit, um, Denise and I worked on this paper on what OBGYN should know about Ebola. We reviewed all the literature. There wasn't a lot of information out there, but we found a couple of things. One is that women seem to be more likely to get Ebola. Is it because women are more likely to be caretakers? Is there some difference in susceptibility, um, really a basically a physical thing? We think it's probably more likely that they're more likely to be caretakers. But we found women were more likely to um, get Ebola. And then it did appear that pregnant women had severe effects from Ebola. What we noticed even more is women who were pregnant who had Ebola, their babies had a very low chance of survival. So it was really like um, almost all babies uh, had died whose moms had had Ebola. Again, is that because they don't have a mom to take care of them anymore and they have had Ebola and so people are afraid to take care of them? I'm not sure, but we knew that they had a very um, low rate of survival. So that's in the 2014 response. You've heard about the 2018 response. We, um, uh, Denise and I were both gone from CDC by this time, but we really felt like it was an opportunity. Um, we had learned a lot about Ebola in, uh, in 2014, but not much about it in pregnant women. And we, in this paper, emphasized the importance of trying to get more information about pregnant women. And we felt like um, that, that the vaccine should be offered to pregnant women. And then the last paper is actually a stat first opinion um, that we wrote um, when the decision was made that uh, Ebola vaccine could be given in the second and third trimester, but not in the first. We felt like women should be offered the opportunity, given informed consent, of course, um, to get the Ebola vaccine given the high risk of death and the high risk especially of their baby dying. Um, uh, so. Uh, you can see that pregnant women issues come up in, uh, they came up in the Ebola response too. And then of course in Zika, um, none of us would care about Zika if it weren't the, for the effects on pregnant women. Um, Zika had been around for a long time, nobody really cared, it was an itchy, rashy illness, but um, it really wasn't until the recognition of babies with microcephaly. And um, I know it seems really obvious now that Zika causes birth defects, but that at the time we wrote this paper, there was a lot of um, uh, people saying that it was vaccines, you know, it's always vaccines, right? Um, that it was um, the mosquito treatments, that it was a mosquito spray that had been used. There was a lot of discussion. And in this is a paper where we tried to carefully lay out the evidence in support that Zika was a um, cause of birth defects. And then this final paper down here is a paper where we um, describe the uh, congenital Zika syndrome. So um, I hope I've made the case that in planning for future epidemics, certain populations need special consideration. And I think pregnant women is one of those populations. It's certainly not the only one. I think children is, is another one. We've written some papers on children too, but I thought I would try to make it. I knew I was between you and the gala. So um, I wanted to make it shorter. Um, we did have a vulnerable populations work group at CDC before the 2009 uh, pandemic, and you can see in that paper there by uh, Sonia Hutchins um, some of the other vulnerable populations we considered in preparing for that uh, pandemic. I also think, I think all of us um, are made the point here that preparedness is critical. Um, and I think the, that meeting was really a critical thing to do um, before 2009 H1N1. And um, I think the inclusion of key partners is really important. Not just having a bunch of experts come together, which to be honest, that was the way I had envisioned me the meeting initially. And it was really um, a, uh, input from my team that said, we need to include these partners, and I think that was really critical when the 2009 H1N1 response started. So I think we're all going to come up and answer questions up here. Thanks. 
Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, we were given strict instructions um, that we, we will have to clear out of here. So um, sadly, we don't have time for a discussion session with our um, experts, but um, I, I'm sure that they would be willing to um, speak with any interested uh, attendees out in the hallways. Um, so this, this session, as exciting as it was, um, I'm sorry that we had to cut it a little bit short, um, but we really do appreciate all of the attendees and the speakers today. Um, just in closing, there are a set of four themes that the organizers use to pull this event together, and I think it really resonated throughout many of the keynotes and throughout this uh, talk that I would just like to share with you um, to kind of hold in your mind as you process the whole day. The four themes are to maintain a future-oriented outlook, to center our work on solutions and action, to rethink public health as a shared mission across academia, community, and industry, and finally, to prioritize collaboration in all the things we do. Um, so particularly for our younger attendees, um, you guys literally are our future. So we're very hopeful that um, this day has been full of new ideas, new connections, and hopefully new directions. Um, so this brings us to the end of today's program. We hope that you know that um, SPH is a partner to you and that you keep in touch. This event will be followed up with um, emails including uh, video, photo, and other uh, web links of interest. Um, and of course, uh, we would be amiss to not recognize the immense effort that went into pulling this event together. Um, this includes uh, members of the 75th Anniversary Planning Committee, uh, folks in the Communications and Dean's Office staff, all of our speakers, our moderators, our many, many volunteers, um, and our sponsors and partners. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to all. Um, but that, of course, with those too many people to name, but then we must really uh, single out three people who really uh, made this event happen with which we could not have uh, seen such success. This is um, Anisha Tucker. I don't know if Anisha's here. They're, they're too busy running the whole thing. But Anisha Tucker, assistant to the dean, Sarah Bjorkman, director of uh, communications, and Louis Clark, chief development officer at SPH. Um, the three of them, and of course, everyone else who made this possible today, uh, deserve a huge round of applause. Thank you. Okay.